we had room to store 15,000 value tubers. But then when you double or triple that, you have to think, okay, I need cold storage for yeah. all these tubers. Yeah. I need access to that cold storage. I need a way to organize it. I mean, I can organize a cabinet of things a whole lot easier than I can organize three storage containers. And what kind of technology do we need for all of that? And Leo here, your host of the Building Bellion podcast. And thanks for stopping by the studio. Pour a glass of whiskey or local beer, take a sip, kick those feet up. We're going to dive into what it means to be a business owner, what it means to be a member of this Bellingham and Whatcom County community, and what it means to find peace and balance while running a badass, high-octane, local, iconic business. Let's jump in. Steve and Sarah, welcome to the Building Bellingham studio. We're season four, episode five. I got it right, Tiffany. I got the, the episode right. Um, but thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, good to be here. You know a little something about flowers, but specifically dahlias. Triple Run Farms, you're here locally in Whatcom County. Run, run me through a little bit more about who you are and, and what you do um, and what problem you set out to solve. Okay, so we're Steve and Sarah. We run and own Triple Run Farms here in Ferndale. So just about 10 minutes north of Bellingham, but we're in Bellingham almost every day. So we are in a great place in the county to be able to reach out to lots of places. We started our business in 2012 as a cut flower farm, actually really just as a hobby and an experiment. And then we needed to turn it into a business when people wanted to pay us money for the products we were creating. So we did. And then... It's a good problem. Yeah, it is a good problem to have. <laughs> we didn't really know where this business would go. We wanted to create something beautiful. We wanted some side income. We wanted to just explore it. Actually, before we started our business, we didn't even think about the fact that there were flower farmers, that there were people who grew Did flowers. Did show up, right? Yeah, well, I guess I had this vague notion that farmers who grew vegetables also had a patch of flowers. And they, I, I don't know. I don't think I really thought yeah, it through. Just a thing. I, yeah, and they... Yeah. But it, it's a billion dollar industry. I mean, our billions of billions. dollars. Yeah, Multiple it is. Billions, yeah. It is a huge thing in the world in Western Washington as well. Because as many of you know, in Skagit County, there is the one of the probably the biggest tulip grower in the United States or in North America. Can't miss it. No, they're yeah. dahlias.com for yeah. sake. So we tulips.com. Oh, sorry. Yeah, they're not dahlias. <laughs> That's your website. <laughs> yeah, no, I wish. Um, we're well, putting we we're probing out there right now. Forever <laughs> owns that. They know us and they're not selling. Yeah. <laughs> In Skagit County, there's tulips.com, um, and they have all kinds of amazing things that go around their own industry, and that's creeping up here too. But um, we grow dahlias primarily now, but in the beginning, we didn't. We grew maybe 50 dahlias our first year and 50 sunflowers and more than that, but a few hundred <laughs> sunflowers, a few hundred zinnias. We just planted everything we could find seeds for and explored it. Our business has changed so much in the past 10 years. It is a little bit breathtaking. Our heads are still spinning a bit, and we probably will change just as much in the next 10 years. You know, when I first started, I was watch other small business people who change their business model frequently. And I would think, oh, they really don't have it all together. Or, oh, <laughs> they need to get... I'm glad idea. we're not but like that. Not. <laughs> but what I know don't now like is that that was not true at all, but rather they were agile and right. aggressive mm -hmm. at finding what was the best course of action for their business for whatever reason it was, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's key, and it has turned out to be key for us as well. Let's go back to that point where you narrowed it down to dahlias. You had how many different varieties of flowers on your oh, on your property? Oh, well over 100 different varieties. And were they oh, random yeah. choices, or were they pretty, you know, oh, I like this flower, or I think this, yeah. or, or more was it like this, I like yeah. this flower, and it is easy to monetize as well? Yeah. I think there was a different uh, variables into why we grew what we grew at first i think beginning really was like sarah said was more of a hobby or more of a, an experiment we were babysitting so much property was it a flower it was property? not it was an orchard okay so i was trying to understand how to i was trying to understand how to grow apples how to yeah. keep them healthy i didn't didn't know anything about that do you eat no a lot farm. of them is that how, do you, oh yeah <laughs> you have to test a lot way too many yeah uh, made a lot of cider yeah. yeah it was good but in the midst of doing that Sarah kind of picked up on this whole opportunity because it was some land that wasn't being used. And then we were given a, a blank slate to do whatever we wanted to do. I thought we would grow vegetables and I would take those to the farmer's market. And that's how we would 
Whatcom County has many, many good vegetable farmers. One, uh, I am not one of them. Yeah. <laughs> so she grew flowers and we sold every stem. Meanwhile, we fed the rabbits and the other pests and uh, occasionally got a carrot or two yeah. out of the patch. Uh, so then that kind of informed what we were growing, why we we're growing it, because we were looking around, hey, what flowers do you need? We'll mm -hmm. grow those. And so then it was, can we grow nigella? Sure. Let's see what nigella what is. is okay. <laughs> yeah. How well, do you grow it when yeah. you start it? And there are certain specific characteristics that make good cut flowers. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so we were growing things for cut flowers and we hooked up with a market in Seattle that gave us a place to sell our flowers mm -hmm. beyond just taking them door to door to different florists and saying, Hey, would you buy my flowers? And then our business took off quickly because we had a very hungry market that was right. ready. So is that how you started with just going from floral, floral, floral shop to floral shop Literally, saying, no. Hey, you like this? Would you come yeah. look at the flowers yeah. in my backseat? Did you start with the vegetable you know? with Steve's vegetables no. and go, you can have this or you can have these? No, no, no. That was, that was an embarrassment we kept under wraps. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There was a long, whole, long play. Yeah. A yeah. fancy radish yeah. stage of our farming. We did. We grew a lot of awesome radishes. <laughs> There's different types. Oh, man. Oh, man. But we grew, we grew probably, many. we probably grew seven or eight types just ourselves. Yeah. Oh, my. You learned something new every day. I didn't, yeah. I just thought there was one radish. It's, you know, it's yay big and it's red and it. That's it. That's all I got. Yeah. In the very beginning, that's what I figured about apples. The guy was looking for somebody to manage property. And I said, he said, would you consider doing this? And I said, I don't know anything about apples. I yeah. said, I do know there's red ones and there's yellow ones. And I think there's green ones. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now I can, I can probably give you about uh, three or four dozen varieties and there's probably about 800 to a thousand. They're yeah. recognized cultivars. Yeah. So yeah. Apple business is a serious business in Washington. <laughs> yeah, you, you walk down the stand at Bellwood and you go, yeah, yeah. Oh, what is this one? They're all di oh, they're all different. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So I'll taste it or two. So you were knocking on doors, and how was that experience for you? Well, you know, it, this was in 2012, and every florist I met was super nice. They didn't always need what I had, but they were encouraging. They were like, yeah, mm -hmm. we would love to have more locally grown flowers, and they were very generous in telling me types of flowers they wanted to have, and so we tried to grow those, and we were just. You know, our business was growing slowly. You know, we can look at year over year, percentage by percentage. It was, it never regressed. It was always growing, but it wasn't until we started wholesaling mm. until we, until we grew enough dahlias that we had extra tubers. We didn't want to plant them all. You know, dahlias do produce a little bit like rabbits. So they make lots of tubers if you grow them well. And we started wholesaling them to another retailer mm -hmm. and we're very happy to do that. I was like, you know what? This is great. I can sell my extra dahlia tubers for a few bucks a tuber and I don't deal with any customer service or try to figure out a, a They deal with them. all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and then after a couple of years, they stopped doing retail dahlia sales. And Steve said, we should start a retail dahlia tuber store. And I kept thinking of all the big problems. All and the Sarah said, no way, we're not equipped for that. <laughs> and I said, we're not equipped to grow flowers, but we're doing a pretty good job of that too. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it was it was very overwhelming to think about all the technological pieces that had to go into that. And I wanted to do it really well. I didn't want to do it halfway. I wanted to make sure that we covered our bases and that we didn't, you know. We kind of do everything on a large scale. Yeah, So I noticed. <laughs> well, we started, yeah. So we started and we sold out all the tubers we put in the store within mm -hmm. just a couple pretty, hours. Yeah, pretty good. Another good quick. problem. Yeah. And then the next year we put three or four times as many in the store and sold out within a couple hours. Mm -hmm. And we built systems that made it so that we could handle shipping and preparing and you know, organizing all those dahlias. And back then, I think dahlia sales were maybe 20% of our business the first year we tried because it was really successful. It took mm -hmm. a big chunk of our business. And, and you're still growing us. other flowers at this time too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they're slowly yes. like eh, going away. Well, well, I think at the time we were just to to, just to add stability to what started as a hobby and was rapidly getting out of control. I knew that there was certain things that we needed to establish. And, and if you're just selling uh, fresh cut flowers or if you're just selling dahlias or if you're, you're just fresh cut dahlias or if you're just selling with tubers, then you've got a limitation on your cash flow because that only happens. Like we only have cut flowers in Whatcom County for the most part. Yeah. A uh, very short window. May to September at best. You know, right. Mostly best. Maybe yeah. October. Maybe October. So storage becomes, you know, yeah. timeline becomes an issue. Yeah. Timeline, right. Because as much as you want a, a peony, if you if you want it in January, 
uh, you can't get it. Yeah. They, they don't grow. So, nowhere on earth or just oh, yeah. nowhere in the Northwest. Well, well, you can't get it locally. Yeah. yeah you can ship sense. it from Chile or Alaska, depending on the time of year for sure. But, if but we, then it's cost prohibitive, yeah. right? Cause then you're yeah. spending $5 just to get it here. Yeah. And then you got to charge for it. So we were, we had a very seasonal business mm -hmm. and growing value tubers allowed us to extend that season quite a bit. How long can you store those for? We store them from October till April and then we ship them. So Do they have to be cold or what's the uh, dark? There's a little bit of magic. Yeah. yeah. I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't make you give it yeah. away. No, oh, no. Do. It's, you have to store yeah. them in a super humid environment. Dark is good. So always mm -hmm. big plus to keep roots in the dark and they don't get stimulated to grow. And then about 40 degrees. Yeah. You can have some wiggle room yeah, yeah. there. Yeah. Airflow. Uh, you got to control your airflow. You got to control your humidity and you got to control your temperature. Those are the three. Those are the three pillars of Dahlia storage. Yeah. <laughs> so the first year we sold Dahlia yeah. tubers, we were probably, it was about 20% of our business. And now mm -hmm. it's 99% of our business. And the other. Everything else is just fun. 1% yeah. <laughs> is like agritourism that. and events and seeds and lots of other things that we do to have diversity. But there's just such a strong demand for Dahlia tubers mm -hmm. right now that it just keeps taking up the lion's share of our it's business. A little bit irrational to yeah. be honest with you that's okay it's, we like it yeah yeah th th there's nothing wrong with liking it we're trying to perpetuate that yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's a point that i'm just kind of feeling out here where you had this it sounds like you had this growth that was or the scaling that was not really you weren't setting out to scale you were you started out with this being a hobby mm -hmm. and then really this is scaling without us intending for it to scale and then there's a point and i'd love to talk about this yeah. where you go okay now we're intending to scale Tell me about that transition from let's ride the let's ride ride the wave to like let's harness the wave let's harness this and scale intentionally from here. Yeah, I think just uh, it kind of goes hand in hand with we didn't know anything about growing flowers uh, and we didn't know anything about the business of flowers, but we figured out the growing. Then we thought we figured out the business, and the more we kind of matured in understanding, we realized that the business of of flower farming or specifically selling dahlias it's 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 unique in that it's different from uh real estate but the the principles are exactly the same right so tapping into that and understanding oh there's a whole you know, there's a whole world of resources to help us understand what's going on a little bit better and then that started to inform what we were doing and why we're doing it because yeah you still you put something in the, in the ground you take care of it and most of the time you're rewarded mm -hmm. with with some uh with a good resort uh, a good result but sometimes that's a little iffy so now you got to plan for that and that has to go into your general scope of what we're doing when we're doing it and why we're doing it mm -hmm. so that we can kind of protect from that yep. so i think our biggest weakness over the years has been that we grow really well our flowers we actually grow things really well and then we find a market for it and we mm -hmm. grow a lot of it and then we hit this bump where we haven't developed the infrastructure from year to year to handle the growth right, in some way. And it's different every time because we don't want to repeat our same mistakes, right? Yeah. So we run into it in different places. Mm -hmm. Oh, we don't have a barn big enough to process <laughs> at 900 bouquets every Tuesday. Yeah. Or we don't have enough employees. Or we don't have enough yeah. capital for the gas right. that it takes to drive it where we need to go. Or, you know, all yeah. those little things. So year by year, we worked those out. And, and I think that it comes, in, it, like, it comes in waves for us. Like we did this with cut flowers where we committed to grow thousands and thousands of sunflowers for groceries and then almost used all of our emotional, mental, and physical resources by the end of the year trying to make it happen because we didn't understand that we needed bits of infrastructure that weren't existing. And we saw that and then we started doing Dahlia tubers and we had room to store 15,000 Dahlia tubers. Then when you double or triple that, you have to think, okay, I need cold storage for yeah. all these tubers. Yeah. I need access to that cold storage. I need a way to organize it. I mean, I can organize a cabinet of things a whole lot easier than I can organize three storage containers. And what kind of technology do we need for all of that? And um, how do we communicate yeah. with our staff who is increasingly not English speaking? And so how do we work with them in all of these ways? So it's just, it has been exciting, an exciting ride. But I think there are patterns of, okay, let's grow because we see a market and we have the ability to grow, but do we have all of the pieces that we need to make sure that we can make it through the season to the next level? And that's another thing about seeing some success and realizing the opportunity. But just because that's out there doesn't mean it's right for us. Right. Right. That, There's so many different avenues you can take. Yeah. Hypothetically, you want to yeah, take yeah. as many of those routes as you can. Mm -hmm. But how do you guys decide on when to expand into different like new lanes 
of the industry or or contract like they're both yeah valuable. Um, i have a really good example yeah. that can answer this question so our wedding flowers business so when uh, we yes. first started growing flowers <laughs> i was like Wedding, 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 wedding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I thought, no, I didn't want to do that because I couldn't design the flowers. I, I could barely buy flowers at the grocery store and make them look decent in a vase. I didn't think they looked good. So I never had fresh flowers. That's because, not actually true. But I felt like that, you know, and we were, we were growing fields of flowers and I rarely, and I started to feel really guilty that, oh, I should be doing something with this resource. So I, I just took pictures of arrangements that I liked and printed them on my printer and taped them to my porch. And I just went out there and picked the flowers I could see in there and tried to recreate it. And I did this every night for a year, a year of growing. And then I started giving them to people once I thought they looked decent. And our flower business started by word of mouth because people would say, oh, I saw your arrangement. Would you make these for me? And I, and I did. And it grew so quickly that within five years, I think we did 300 summer weddings and we That's designed all of it, it was a lot. It was too much. But it makes me think um, <laughs> too much. Yeah. It was. Um, yeah. That's Gladwell, that's probably we'll probably say that about most aspects of our business. Oh, you're doing a great, yeah, it's too much. Malcolm Gladwell yes. talks about that ten thousand hours of practice right. in, in his outliers book. I outliers, think. yeah. And and he says almost anyone can be decently good at something if they'll just practice it, if they practice it well. And I absolutely believe this. I, I haven't reached ten thousand hours with podcasting yeah. yet, so I'm still on that <laughs> Keep journey. Keep going. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you reach ten thousand yeah. ten thousand hours of flower designing, but I'm confident in doing it now, and I can teach other people how to do it. And if I had to, we could start a flower designing business now and go on with it. But just simply because I practiced it, and I really, I really see this as a message I want to tell a lot of small business owners that you don't have to be an expert at something. If you love it and you want to try it, you should try it and you should practice it and just see where it goes. You should just mm -hmm. start and see where it goes. Um, some businesses obviously need technical training or licenses. I'm not just talking about that. The medical but, field. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you some practice first. Or uh, airline pilots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please. But, um, but like just things that you think you might want to use as a side stream of revenue or to turn it into your main source of revenue, I think you should try it. But we stopped doing wedding flowers because every Friday and Saturday and lots yeah. of Sundays we were Weddings just, are a lot. yeah, I wasn't with my kids. Um, I, we now have kids that are uh, 15 and 12, but you know, five years ago they were late elementary school and we didn't have time to do fun things because we were forever with all the nice weather. We Can't you just give them a flower weddings. or a toy <laughs> yeah. or something? You know, oh, they did plenty of that. <laughs> I would take them to an event and buy them a new Lego kit and put them in the corner and be like, make this. Show me what you can make, and it would yeah. work. But you know that, that you can go broke buying Lego kits. <laughs> yeah, you, they're they were always expensive. They're still expensive. Yeah. You, yeah. you just talked about creativity, and I just want to take a moment to talk about that because you both have this like, and I don't know you well. As we're getting to know each other better, and your story, something that I'm learning is that you have this willingness to try. You have this willingness to like, hey, like give it a shot. Mm -hmm. What's the worst that could happen? Now, is this something that? you both you were born and you had this innate like ability to try things or did your parents raise you in a way that was like hey go go out and you know get dirty and bang your knee and figure yeah. it out yeah normally yeah. normal normal relationships one is uh, a little bit more risky and the other one is a little uh, a little more stable a little more cautious and it sometimes can go very very badly if who's the pirate both, <laughs> both of us you're both pirates both of us are <laughs> we are not, not risk averse we are not <laughs> we, we discovered that we're like <laughs> Let's try it. Or we could fail miserably. Maybe. Yeah. Or I remember maybe we could succeed. Yeah. You're saying you, there's a chance. Yeah. When you were a kid, you would dig up worms and sell them to fishermen and you would breed guppies and sell them to the pet store owner. And I would go around and sell homemade stationery to my neighbors. And my parents found out that I collected all this money from my lovely neighbors. So you've always been we somewhat were. entrepreneurial. But we finding didn't, problems, yeah. being, be, finding we a solution. Did, we didn't know what that word meant yeah. back then. No. Yeah. It's, it's overrated. It's called we call it entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurial. Yeah. <laughs> Just over, it's just overused. So, yeah. Anyways, I was just curious. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I think that that is a hallmark of, of ours that we we are curious. We want to know how things happen. We don't want to just just make money. We want to mm -hmm. we want to do something that's delightful. And we had this opportunity that I feel like was such a gift that we were in a place where there was some land that we could practice growing. We did not know what we were doing. We absolutely did not. We, had, we still don't know what we're doing. We, had, don't let kid you. <laughs> we we read every book and listened to every. We were listening to podcasts we, then. We used we, Google and YouTube a yeah, lot back yeah, then. Yeah. Other people's blogs, I would just stare at pictures and think, how did they grow that? How did they plant that? What is that right there? And just we just tried to copy it. And then we used the... And we were really excited when we found somebody that says, you can't do this. Uh, this this flower is really hard to grow. Oh, really? Yeah. And we like challenges. <laughs> Say I can't. So, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, all those things go into yeah. doing what we do now. Mm -hmm. 
you know, as you, as you go through life, the stakes get higher. Like, I really mm-hmm. don't want to fail with a high schooler and a middle schooler, right? We want to make sure we, we have a stable life for them. So I think that our the things that we try now are a little less risk averse than they were in 2012, but that's still running through our veins for sure. So balance, what does that mean to you? You're scaling a business. There's two sides. There's being a parent. There's being a partner. There's being a business partner. Mm-hmm. How do you balance all these things? Because I know I've struggled with these, these concepts um, at different points in my career. Whatever you want to tell me about it, tell me about your journey with finding some sort of sanity and balance. So the obvious response is, what is this balance you speak of? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we went through this whole phase where we talked about what hat we were wearing. Like, am I wearing my wife hat or my mom hat or my, mm-hmm. for a while. It's a good one. You know, yeah. We were, yeah. yeah, or my farmer hat or my, yeah. And, and, and just sort of compartmentalizing those roles help a, a good bit. I think at the beginning, we were way off balance. We worked all the time. We just worked. We, we went to church on Sunday and we worked 24 seven all the rest of the <laughs> days, you know, but we, you know, when your kids are super little and you're farming, you can just put them in a backpack or take them along with you and they love it. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's not an unhealthy thing to be no, doing. Yeah, yeah. No, but as they got a little bit older and they started having, you know, want to play sports or do other things, we started realizing, I mean, we should have realized it before probably, but maybe. So we needed to have a little better work-life balance. It's elusive. It's really hard to find, especially if you do what you love. But just because you're doing what you love and you're working for it doesn't mean that it's healthy for you to do it all the time. Right. I think Steve does a really good job. Please don't think I'm making fun of you, but he has a really good job at balancing. She's He'll making s- fun of you. No, yeah. not. He's definitely <laughs> he will fun. stop and rest. He'll stop and do something that he enjoys, where I find myself having a harder time doing that. Not out of guilt, but because like, just my favorite thing is to yeah. work. I love it. It's, yeah. I can avoid all my other problems by just working. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, Sorry, I couldn't handle that. Sorry, I couldn't. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. have to work. <laughs> yeah. but, Sorry, we can't come to your podcast. Yeah. We got a farm. Yeah, we got a farm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a reasonable excuse. Yeah. When we were first married, I remember one Saturday, Steve was like, let's go do this fun thing and then we'll come back home and move on to the chores. And I was just like, oh, we got to do all that first. And then we. Who are you? Because yeah. my. You've got you know, boxes to check. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So, but, but we've, I think we've, as we've grown together in marriage, this year we'll be married 18 years. All right. We've, and we've been business partners for over 10 years. I feel like we're rubbing off on each other in, in that way. And it's a good thing to find balance because I don't think either one of us is very balanced. <laughs> So you're finding balance and imbalance? Yeah, maybe that's a good way to put it. We're uh, finding balance. I was just by... trying to sound cool in that moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't, it doesn't mean anything cool. what I said. Yeah. It didn't work. Well, the Completely imbal- flopped. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, truisms. I can, you yeah, say no, truisms. I can see what, where that is because what feels balanced to me and what feels naturally balanced to you is actually imbalanced and, and you know, moving out of our comfort mm-hmm. zone and finding something that is truly more, you know, I've just been starting putting my phone down at a certain time every mm. night. And I mostly have my phone so I can work, so I can tweak stuff in the website or answer questions on social media or um, be an email or something. And I started putting it down. And it's I, I found myself walking around my house like, Okay. Doesn't like being put down. No, <laughs> like now what do I do? I mean, so all the to, tours are yeah. done. It's like the my... Ring of Power from yeah. the Lord of the Rings. Come back to me, my precious, my precious. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm I'm making myself get through this exercise right now. Just. Well, who knows how long we last? Yeah, <laughs> but because I'm wanting to open up other ways to find better balance, better, mm-hmm. you know, work-life balance is a cliche, but for us, it's kind of like family life balance mm-hmm. for now. And I guess when the, when our kids are more grown up, it still will be somewhat. But it'll, you know, we just want to be building relationships with people, not just living our life to make money or to make a successful business or to meet. You know, we, we talk a lot about relationships, like. In the summertime, sometimes we have to just stop and go for a walk in the flowers, sort of like a mini Sounds date. Sounds really rough. I feel bad yeah. for you that you have to <laughs> Well, for... I mean, it's, it, we have to start calculating the flowers and go and well, enjoy the flowers. And when we're walking in those flowers, we have to put our phones away and put mm-hmm. our notepads away. Because when we walk through the flower field, we, oh, hold on. Take a picture. I, I need to address this. Take a note. Yeah. What is that? Yeah, yeah. Make, there's make that weed it. there. The, oh, right. that irrigation needs fixing. Oh, I need to. No, we got to stop that and just enjoy. Right, because we have... Almost a thousand varieties of flowers to manage. We have a crew that we just carry. dahlias. A thousand yes, just varieties. dahlias, and um, we dahlias, do grow yeah. about a hundred other flowers. We co-plant for biodiversity, and mm. also so people will see how good our seeds look with our dahlia tubers. Let's take it. Let's let's go down <laughs> the science road. Because yeah. We yeah. Can. yeah, yeah, because you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's let's just dive into science for a moment. Biodiversity. Why is that important? Plant different types of flowers, roots, soil. Tell me about all those things. That's all I know about flowers. Yeah. Well. I think the initial 
maybe the biggest payoff for biodiversity is pest control mm -hmm. or the health of the plant. Mm -hmm. So if there is, uh, let's say you have an American chestnut tree mm -hmm. and you say, hey, this is really good. And you plant thousands of them all together. If a pest that is going to, um, if that if that's really susceptible to one type of pest, then that pest comes in and knocks out your whole chestnut orchard, yeah. which actually happened in American history. If you look at, it. we don't have any American chestnuts left except for one or two. Just imported chestnuts now? Yes. Yeah. yeah, they really are. They're hybridized. Yeah. They're hybridized. So that kind of crop is called a monocrop. Yeah. Right. Where you have only one kind. Right. And then th this war that's taking place against big egg, quote yeah. unquote, that's part of the argument. This actually has a little bit of truth. If you plant 10,000 acres of wheat, well, let's just say this, Whatcom County, we grow a lot of raspberries, yeah. which is a fantastic crop. They grow really yeah. well here. But let's say we just went ahead and grew nothing but raspberries here. So Covered the whole county. Yeah, there's a couple of problems with that. Number one, all of the pollinators and everything that relies on food for raspberries, that's a short window. Yeah. So they make a lot of food during, especially the bees. Mm -hmm. right? You hear there's bee wars, right? So the bees make a, a ton of honey when uh, raspberries are in bloom. But then the raspberries stop blooming and they put the fruit on and there's no more food in the raspberries. So now those pollinators got to find something different. So if we had all, let's say we grew all roses, mm -hmm. there would be a lot of food for the insects and for the bees and for everything else while they're flowering. And then they stop flowering. Then what happens to all that? So if there's no overlap. Yeah. The there bee population right. disappears. It's also, part of the problem we're having with no. our European, because we don't have an American bee that we keep in colonies. We actually, it's a European honeybee. Mm -hmm. So um, managing that is important. And that's why a professional beekeeper will take them and they'll start them in California and they follow what they call is the, uh, they call it the, um, the sap trail or the, the fruit, uh, it's um, basically a pollen trail, mm. pollen trail. Yeah. yeah. So when the almonds in California, uh, flower, that's where the bees are. And then all of a sudden there's another crop and they move all the bees over to the other crop and it just keeps coming. It comes right up here to Washington, to Oregon, to our pears, to our plums, and then to our apples, to the cherries. And so there's this little track. And it's that way because they're looking for maximum production, right? Mm -hmm. But even in our small ecosystem here, we're looking at whole, having a healthy environment. Mm -hmm. So all of the other things that depend on food and the different things that we're growing, we overlap them for the benefit of everything else. And then also if we struggle with um, a particular insect and we have dahlias planted right next to, let's say, dill. Something loves to eat the dahlias. They don't like the dill so much. And mm -hmm. then, you know, you go into different types. So it helps us manage that. Uh, and also pol mm -hmm. pollinators balance each other. Mm -hmm. Not every pollinator is good in the sense of it's pollinators are good because they help us make fruit, right? right? Not mm -hmm. just fruit. To but eat, not but every fruits. pollinator is good for every flower. Right. Yeah. Some, mm -hmm. some bugs that are pests for flowers do also pollinate. And there are ones that we consider beneficial pollinators and ones that aren't as beneficial. And they balance each other in the population. So we give them all different kinds of environments. But also, it's not just bugs or insects, but it's disease that can Jeez. attack a certain kind of plant and won't attack another kind of plant. Mm -hmm. And so we are basically, you probably learned in eighth grade about crop rotation, right? You don't grow potatoes in the same field. Not at, not at Roosevelt. <laughs> not no, no, sorry, not at uh, <laughs> the Extend Middle School in Seattle. We were learning about plant urban planning or something. Oh, it's well, that's city. valuable too. I'm yeah. just kidding. I don't know where you're learning. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't grow potatoes in the same field year after year after year, or the pathogens that attack potato plants become endemic in that soil, and you mm -hmm. you you rotate your crops if you're a good farmer. You know, this is why you'll see farmers around town pulling out raspberries after I think it's seven years generally, a number of years, and they'll plant mm. something different there for a while, or they'll take. Because the soil is still good, but the but you have to rotate that. Right, you got to when those things take there. something out of the soil. So potatoes take something different than uh, winter wheat mm -hmm. or the raspberries or one of the, the rotational crops. Yes. We grow a lot of seed potatoes here. So to mm -hmm. get, make sure you grow the best seed potatoes, you grow them in a plot for one year. You take them out and you amend that soil with stuff you know that that soil is going to need. And then you plant raspberries for a couple of years. This so, sounds really simple. Yeah, well, <laughs> these big Drive with bees in your car up the coast. Yeah. <laughs> Rotate your crops. Simple. Right? Anyone can do it. So we, if it were easy, we wouldn't have the problems that we have. Indeed. Our farm is about 20 acres, and we're just a tiny little drop in the bucket of agriculture in Washington State. But for what we are doing, we're doing our best to be diverse in the way we don't plant our rows in the same place. We do a fair amount of agritourism at our farm, and we do really wide walkways in between our rows. We could grow more crops if we just crammed them a little bit closer together, but we want them to be accessible for all kinds of people to be able to come and walk or drive their um, accessibility mobiles, their wheelchairs right. in our fields or whatever it is to, to, to feel really comfortable. And so 
we can move our field over six feet every year mm -hmm. and grow plants in the aisles where there was only clover and grass the year before. So it's, but, sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes I'm just a little crooked when I draw. But, <laughs> I, but you're organized. And yeah. like, let's, yeah. I mean, so let's talk about how, how you're, you guys are crooked, but organized <laughs> with your planting. So, Excellent. so, yes. so it, with all of these different, different varieties, species of dahlias, is it, mm -hmm. is it a species of dahlia? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so right. How do you organize that? Cause they probably don't, have like the, as tubers they when you're planting them they probably don't look different they just gotta talk different. to them hey what's your name again <laughs> okay. yeah. so, so okay. it does yeah. take okay. a tremendous amount of organization so when we plant our dahlias we plant all of one variety together best case scenario and you're sure right <laughs> we, well we plant it and then we label it in a couple of different ways and then when they bloom we have whole weeks of the year where our crew goes around and checks every plant are you who you're supposed to be and make sure. And then at some point, all the ones that, you know, we have a problem with geese that come to our mm. farm and nose dahlias out. And so then our crew will go find a tuber and they'll let's tuck it in the ground somewhere. And yeah, <laughs> it's they, always they exciting. Scoop them out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then they might not always get put back in the right place, but I mean, it's a handful. It's like less than 1% of our tubers that that happens too. So as long as our labels are correct, we plant everything. And then when we harvest, we, redundantly label everything so in the cooler everything has two labels so that we try to keep it all really straight and we don't sell all the varieties that we grow um one big thing that we do at our farm that we haven't even talked about yet is this is your brainchild steve you want to talk about our legacy program in the beginning the the varieties of dahlias that we started to grow and really all the varieties of flowers we would we would see um a really good scabiosa like mm -hmm. that's the scabiosa that's the blue scabiosa we're going to grow for the dahlias. Hey, this one really holds up well in the base. It has good form and all the other criteria that we're looking for. So we started growing those. And then just in our trying to understand more about flowers, trying to understand more about dahlias, I started attending um, the Whatcom County Dahlia Association. It's just a little club of people. I, I didn't know it was there. It is. Now I do. It is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they're a cool group. Just in understanding a little bit more about dahlias and learning from them, from those folks, I got to know that some of those people actually made their own variety. Like they hybridized yeah. different type of plants. You've, you've got annuals and you've got um, uh, perennials. Well, a dahlia, you can start it from a seed mm -hmm. as an annual. You know, you plant it this year, it grows up and it could be a red flower. Mm -hmm. And then you save the seeds from that red flower and you plant them again. You might not get a red flower. You might get a pink flower. You might get a yellow flower. Okay. You might get... How many, and there's different seeds have different varietals. Well, so if you plant a sunflower seed, you're going to get a sunflower. Mm -hmm. It's going to look pretty close to what you planted. But a dahlia is an octoploid, and it has more chromosomes. And so the thing is, it can grow something completely different. And usually it does. Yeah. It has incredible I, genetic diversity. It yeah. does. It's really yeah. incredible. We, we used to grow a lot of what we called a ball form dahlia. Okay. So it's really tight. The the uh, the petals wrap. And so it's just some geometrical. It looks it ships well. Yeah, it ships, ships well. well. That's a big, that was a big criteria for us at the beginning. But if you take the seeds from that, probably about 70, 80% won't be a ball form. They might be an open center. They might be a really big one. They, I mean, they're just going to do all kinds of stuff because they're just like, I'm going to do whatever I want. Yeah. Exactly. Because they're exactly. cross pollinating with lots of different dahlias. Mm -hmm. Right. You have to take the tuber or part of the plant and grow that to get that same dahlia that you were looking for. So most of the people in the association are um, on the older side of life. Mm -hmm. 70s and 80s and they actually are making their own varieties and i'm just blown away by the fact that these dahlias um, that i'm looking for in these big catalogs or these uh great big shows the guy who made it is right here in linden yeah i'm like this is amazing and, and not only did he make a few that are available worldwide but he's yeah. got hundreds yeah. of varieties that aren't distributed and so i just decided well let's grow his varieties. I mean, yeah. he's right here. How cool is that? Bellingham is very in tune with, Hey, this is, this is grown locally. Yeah. It was made locally and grown locally. Right. So that's even cooler in my book. Well, um, most of the folks that I met that actually do that kind of thing, they are in their seventies or sixties mm -hmm. or eighties. And, um, they have some of the most sought after dahlias, but they're just growing them in their backyard. Mm -hmm. And once they make it, and they sell a few and then somebody else sells a few and then it goes to a company maybe a farm like ours who might grow a couple hundred of them then it starts to get out there but the person who made that dahlia they're not really profiting mm -hmm. when my farm grows a thousand of this i am partnering with these guys yeah. and i'm saying when i sell one of these tubers i'm going to give you a dollar for everyone that has your name on it yeah. everyone that you created so now 
they're just doing what they like to do. And that's come up with these cool, odd Brilliant. dahlias. And they're giving it to me. And I'm selling them and I'm giving them checks every year. So happy. Yeah. expand their crop. We grow it out right. and then we market it to our customers and we ship it and they don't have to worry about anything besides the royalty. So they could patent it. That's a really great question. There it are is. areas of the plant world that plant propagation has strict patent rules. Roses are really, this hardly exists at all in the Dahlia world. And we're trying to, from a grassroots level, change this. Because they can't recreate the same, most people can't recreate the same no. Dahlia, right? No, no I mean, you, you can't. Uh, but the yeah. thing is, so if you, uh, I'll just take a name of a popular rose, David Austin. That's okay. a popular garden rose that people would know if they grow roses. And if you start selling that, if you start propagating those uh, roses and selling it, you could be in a lot of trouble. Uh, so there are dahlias like that, that yeah. everyone's like, this is my unicorn. I wish I could just get this dahlia. Right. But even if they were to get it, if you bought your wife at David Austin, if the nursery is doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're paying a, a royalty back to yeah, yeah. the David Austin company. Um, eventually it will get there, mm -hmm. but that's not happening. So Steve's idea was let's do this in a way that can benefit these creators. And it has been such an awesome thing for our business because these people aren't just interested in sharing their values with you or with us, but their knowledge as well. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're natural mentors and they mm -hmm. are incredibly generous with letting us come and look in their fields and they want to know what do your customers want? And we want yeah. to know everything that they have, you know, we yeah. just are learning so much from them and just, benefiting from their years and years of experience in life, as well as their value knowledge. That they're so it's the problem friends. that you solved. It's the problem that your business yeah. solved, what, which was connecting the creator. Cause not every creator, there's so many amazing creators out there. Mm -hmm. but not every creator is a business person nope. or wants to be a business person. Well, and that's the thing that we hit on very early. Only a couple of them um, were actually uh, uh, selling at any scale, but it was all small, right? Yeah. They, they put 20 in the ground and next year they're going to put another 20 in the ground and they sell whatever they don't want to keep for their own fields. So it's very limited. Right. And meanwhile, everybody's like, we got to get that one. But then the second thing is there are some people that want to create it, but they don't want to talk to people. Yeah. They don't, they don't want to sell to people. They don't want to have to, okay, you want 15 of this. You want two of that. And you want one of that. That's too much work. I'm just going to go out in my garden and garden. So we take over that aspect of it and like she said, we kind of grow a lot more than just 20 yeah. and then we ship them all over the United States. And so it's been really great for us to get to know these people better and to help them get their creations out into the world. Yeah. And so it's also a way for our business to not just be profitable, but do some good in the world, like mm -hmm. do some social good by helping these people have, you know, augment their retirement. But we also are trying to be really careful with them and help them. We are not financial advisors and we're not giving mm -hmm. them financial <laughs> advice, but we are helping them realize that they may need some financial <laughs> advice as their income. Yeah. Um, increases. So it's just been, there's a lot of room for this to grow for our two-way relationship. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good problem to have. Yeah. It's like, this check, is this going to mess your, uh, your pension up? Okay, yeah. Well, <laughs> then you should talk to somebody who deals with money because the weekend. Don't deposit it yet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Just hold yeah. off on deposit. Yeah. But you know, it, it is an exciting <laughs> problem to have. It's a, it's a good way for us to, to speak in lean into their lives. I want to shift into demand. I think flowers are beautiful. I think there's lots of beautiful flowers. Um, and I definitely know of dahlias. How are there people out there that are like, I know this was specific dahlia and I have to have it. And there's, there's this one guy in Linden that has 20 of these and I'm willing to pay probably a lot for it. Yeah. Like a pretty penny for yeah. this unique dahlia. How do you find these people? How do you find people that not only just love flowers, <clears throat> but no dahlias? Most of our marketing has been from social media. Um, we do almost no paid marketing each year, but we started our Instagram account in 2014 and it's really blossomed and grown. And I like it. Blossomed. Yeah. Well, 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 <laughs> it, has, <laughs> and it has given us a way to, to impact a lot of people's lives by providing content that's <laughs> educational, but also that shows our, our products that we sell. That, that's It's a really good question. The Dahlia community, like most small communities like this, is pretty tight knit. And if someone hears about someone else who's selling Dahlia YouTubers, you know, word of mouth is really powerful. Mm -hmm. So um, I wouldn't say that it's just social media. We have a really mm -hmm. good size email list. People sign up so that they can get notification of when we're going to have a sale. But the demand is huge. Like this is, it's crazy what happens when you have a Dahlia sale. We only tell our email list and we will sell out tens of thousands of Dahlia tubers in a number of minutes. And we get, actually, I have to like gear myself up mentally, turn off the comments on my social media because we get so much hate mail from people who didn't get what they wanted. You, you know, ruined my life. I needed this pink Dahlia. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it's just, it was, it's either pink, blue, <laughs> yellow, white. Yeah, I, get these I was too. talking to a, another Dahlia grower this week who had a sale oh, and yeah. I just reached out to her because I saw the comments on our social media. People are just 
livid with her that they didn't get basically having a fit because they didn't get what they want i just yeah. reached out to her and said i i just want to see if you're doing okay i care about you i want you to remember that this is a sign that your business is doing well and it's not your responsibility to meet everyone's you know i said all the things yeah. to her right and she she those were some brutal comments she was she was hurting a little bit and so it's something that we deal with as part of our business people just think oh flowers are so wonderful and they are but um it's just this is the reason why we didn't want to do retail tubers in the beginning because sometimes customer service can be such a brutal part of it so one day we're going to grow big enough that we'll have a customer service team we already have one person who does this and helps us out with this but then we can not have to deal with that part of it but I shouldn't just be talking about how negative it is. That's yeah. personally for me, Steve. But it's the reality of it. I think, and that's, yeah. I'm not, it doesn't, there's, there is negative in running a yeah, business. There is that sure. part of it, which I appreciate the vulnerability around that because I, it resonates with me. You get this feedback from people and as you scale, you have less and less of an opportunity to make a direct relationship with somebody. You're, you're, you know, social media, 75, 80,000 people that are following what you're doing and, and really appreciate it. But there are people out there that, one thing sets them off or that's just the way humans are, right? It is totally true. So earlier I was talking a little bit about relationships, how we try to maintain our own. And then we, in my mind, we have like these tiers, you know, we have our, our kids right at the heart of it. Right. And then we have friends and family, our church community and social media is such an in your face, available, easy to access community mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. it's easy for that to move really close to the inner, to uh, inner circle yeah. more quickly. Yeah. One And one thing we've yeah. done this past year, we've just started and it is going really well is that we've started a members only digital community that people can buy a year subscription to. And then those people, we're talking face to face with them almost every day, like mm. with DMs or like FaceTime type thing or chatting with them and answering their specific questions. And I feel less pressure to deal with the 75,000 Instagram questions since I have these other people that I'm committed to investing in. And, and when I just kind of think about the balance of, OK, who who do I really need yeah. if, if my daughter needs me to help her with something personal in our house? That's way more important than answering this question from someone who's squawking really loudly mm -hmm. on my social media or on my phone. Mm -hmm. My daughter might be asking me really quietly, and it's super easy for me to get that twisted around the way it mm -hmm. shouldn't be. So anyway, mm -hmm. we've tried to put in some protections against that. But it is a it's an intentional decision to think about outcomes versus feelings mm -hmm. for me every day. And with social media, the people that are making the most noise or being the most malicious, <clears throat> it's such a small percentage. Mm -hmm. you, you just pay attention to them because they're the ones that are just rah, 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 but it's just a small percent of a percent. And then you look at everybody else, you're like, well, everybody else yeah, is- They don't have the same problem. No, they're yeah. loving it. They're saying, thank you so much. This is the best Dahlia tubers we ever got, or this is the best service, or you're the best company. And it's just these two people or these three people over here that are rah, 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 rah. And we're really committed to dealing with those people kindly. They deserve yeah. kindness and they yeah. deserve- A response. Um, a, a response, right. But it's just, what I have to be careful of is not letting that tilt my thinking. And not spending four hours on that comment and only 30 seconds on this comment. And no. it might not be four hours that we're working on it, but four hours that we're obsessing about it, right? right? right, 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 right. Yeah. We, it's very generous. Yeah, well, I'm obsessing. Yeah. It doesn't, yeah. yeah. Staying in our lanes helps too, because where that does kind of wound her personally, it doesn't really wound me. How did you grow that filter? I mean, did you start out with a filter like that or did, did was everything created equally when you started? And then all of a sudden you had to just, you, like you just became more yeah. aware of what the priorities were as you grew your mission, vision, values for your company. Yeah. I definitely think we grew into it. Yeah. yeah. And I, yeah. I do think as you just mature, I mean, as we mature in our relationship to each other, some things that we, uh, uh, some things about Sarah, Sarah that I, in the beginning of our relationship, I really appreciated. Now I realize how much more I appreciate it, uh -huh. even though I was very appreciative and mm -hmm. I, I loved the person that she was, I know now okay, I still love the person that she is, but um, I might need to protect her from those malicious comments mm -hmm. because she doesn't weather those storms very well where, he, you know, you can really say anything you want to me and I just don't care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so at the beginning of our business, like we would be like, oh, there's an opportunity. Let's go for well, it. Yeah. And we would yeah. dive in head first. Yeah. And sometimes not fully over. analyze no, right. all of the no, pros and cons of it. Yeah. So yeah. Exciting. Yeah. Somebody says, wow, you guys do great stuff. Could you supply this? Sure. But saying yes to this opportunity, yeah. you by default are saying no to some other things. Yeah. So really 
kind of looking at that and saying, oh, yes, this is an opportunity to make this person really happy to fulfill that, you know, to serve their need. But that might mean that you have to say no to 15 other people. Mm -hmm. Well, now you have to start weighing and say, well, you know, is it fair to my business that I'm trying to keep healthy to say no to these all these other opportunities just so I can service that one customer? Maybe sometimes and maybe no sometimes and so just just having uh having a mature perspective and a mature system yeah. that says okay i got a request to do this but let me ask my business partner before i just say yeah we'll do that yeah well it works we're taking a hike <laughs> like i have this this really the moment when i decided i wasn't doing weddings in king county or snohomish county anymore was i was driving to do a wedding yeah. at a tree farm in it's a yeah. And I was south I, of the wall. I had been right? so busy that I had everything all made except for the what some of the flowers needed to go in these little picks full of water to go into the arbor. So I was driving and I didn't know where I was going. I'd been there one time for a visit with the bride and I didn't remember. So I had my phone clipped onto the yeah. air conditioning vent. I had a bucket of water right here and I'm driving with one hand. And I'm filling water picks with my left hand and watching the map and watching the, I mean, this is a very irresponsible story to tell, yeah. but I, if there's any law enforcement, the traffic, um, yes, we, we don't ever do that anymore. Filling water picks, just like in just one handed, one handed. And <laughs> The traffic got really thick and the car in front of me slammed their brakes on and I slammed my brakes on and my phone went boop, right into that bucket of water. Well, I had no way to know where I was going anymore because my phone was dead. <laughs> and I remember stopping at a um, a casino gas station and finding a pay phone. It was, there was still a pay phone and finding a quarter and calling Steve. I'm like, can you please map quest my place to me? And it was, and I was also listening to the kids in the background. And it just was like this moment of clarity when everything kind of chinked into place. Like, why am I doing this? Sure, it's profitable, but what's it costing me? And yeah. so those kind of moments are good because they can help you realize decisions you need to make in the future. Like I could do this, but what will it actually cost me? Well, yeah, and I think maturing as humans, but as business people too, there there is a little bit of, I guess, self-aggrandizing or something. Yeah, I can do this. Yeah. I can I can do anything. I can I can operate on four hours of sleep while I'm doing this, and then at the same time I can do this and this and this and this. Those chickens are going to come home to roost, yeah. right? And obviously, you have to buy another iPhone. Yeah. Uh, you know, just little things like that. Or, again, saying yes to all these kind of opportunities that seem great. And maybe, you know, you can beat your chest and say, yeah, yeah. look what I did. If you just step back, you're like, boy, if I just wasn't so, I wasn't beating my chest so much, I could do something way better that would serve more people. And it would just be and be more of your ideal yeah. customer right. as well. Yeah. I think there is a sort of frenzy that happens at startup, right? Mm -hmm. For any business, there is a pace that you figure out which yeah. throwing a bunch of spaghetti at the wall. Right, but that's yeah. not sustainable. <laughs> so to try to keep doing that ten years or twenty years into your mm -hmm. business, I think that's where you're not going to be as that's beyond being agile. That's just you're mm -hmm. not going to be healthy. Right, and it limits you too, right? Yep. You know, when your business can be very profitable while well, you can handle all the work, but then inch deep, mile wide versus yeah. mile deep, inch wide. I think I right. got that right. Yep, you did. We're going to say yes yeah. anyway. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> I finally got something right. Um, let's talk about brand. The social media is a big part of how you communicate your brand, which you guys have done an amazing job with, you know, just scrolling through. I feel like I understand, you know, you get to know the people behind the brand and that's like, that's how we operate. And it really means a lot to me when I see another brand that's, that's going, look, this is who we are. This is how we operate. We're human. We want to show you what we do. We want to show you that we're we're local. Whatever the mission, vision, values are. Um, so you guys have done an amazing job with that. Coming from someone that has you know twelve hundred followers on uh, Instagram <laughs> to someone who's you know. But I, I, the whole point is, let's talk about brand. How did you come up with the name? How did you? What was your launch angle with Triple Rent Farms? Did you say? <laughs> Our launch angle. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah. We, <laughs> we didn't have we, a launch angle. We didn't understand <laughs> anything. Well, well, you did. We didn't, but we didn't yeah. know what it was. Yeah, there you yeah. go. It was pointing, the, it wasn't pointing yeah. into the ground. It was pointing at least somewhat off the ground. So we needed to name our business because we needed a business license yeah. because we needed to cash a check. Okay. So we were like, I, we were it's always about money. Our head, like, money, 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 money. What are we going to name this business? We didn't even know. I'm going to tell the story. Okay. I clearly remember Steve standing in the house to me and saying, well, this isn't going to go anywhere anyway. Just call it. <laughs> triple run because our son is Steve the third. Yeah. We call him Trey. It's his nickname. Yeah. So he's the triple. Yeah. And our daughter is Chloe Wren. So yeah. her middle name is Wren. So triple run. Yeah. Just call it that because that's cute and that'll be great. And I just think about it a lot. This isn't gonna turn into anything yeah. anyway. Yeah. So <laughs> you were being just a doubter. She always rubs it into my face no. that we're like, well, we need to get a business license. Yeah. So a business license, I think at the time was 16. nineteen dollars. Yeah, nineteen. I'm like, 
we're not going to buy a business license until we actually have cash flow. Yeah. <laughs> well, it makes sense. So. And he wasn't being rude or unkind. It's just like, literally, we bootstrapped our business. We used our tiny tax refund and I <laughs> sold a musical instrument so we could buy our first seats. Like, we were literally poor as church mice. <laughs> we, yeah. we had risked a lot to move here from the Southeast for a job for Steve, um, a contract job that ended up ending after about two years. And we were just like, about to move back east because we didn't yeah. know what else to do. We were like when when we started farming. So we saw a spark of vision of where this could go. I don't think we thought it would go where it is today, but as far as our angle, I didn't I kind of knew that social media existed and wasn't really a part of my life. When we had had the business for about two years, we were selling at the market in Seattle and there were lots of people asking me for my Instagram. So I started an Instagram and yeah. I think that it grew quickly because we had lots of people who were already interested in our business because mm -hmm. of that market and then through word of mouth once we began posting regularly and really trying to teach people about what we do, it grew much more quickly. People became more interested in it. Pretty pictures of flowers is a good thing to do on Instagram. It's a whole aesthetic, yeah. right? Yeah. Nature so, of flowers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it worked yeah. really well for that. You know, you'd mentioned you know, faith, you'd mentioned your vision of how you wanted to live your life, all of these things. Well, I've noticed that when a business has, or when people have a really strong why and reason for doing what they're doing, no matter what it is, yeah. <laughs> positive things mostly, um, they find their way to success because they love what they do and they have a really strong why. Tell me about yeah. faith, events, kind of all this part of your business that's grown yeah. um, and community yeah. for that matter. Sure. Yeah, I think with uh, uh, working hard, I think most people, if you work hard, you'll you'll experience a little bit of success. And as we had a little bit of success, we looked at ourselves and said, okay, if we weren't worried about failing, if we didn't have to worry about anything, what would we do if, what direction we would would we go with our business? What would we do? What would we focus on? And, and, and so we have questions we, like, what makes us happy? What do yeah. we, we, we have time in the winter, especially right. before we were selling value shooters to talk about these things. Yeah. <laughs> what makes yeah, us we happy? We used to have time in the <laughs> winter, it was free. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. what, what makes us happy? What yeah. do we most, what do we feel most fulfilled when we're doing? Right. We have the luxury of asking ourselves those questions. Yeah. Yeah. And so having more on form uh, events really centered around mm -hmm. our faith mm -hmm. and uh, inviting people to just examine and, and to look at that and then creating uh, a space for that to happen is kind of the way we shifted things mm -hmm. and then it just kind of went hand in glove with the dahlia side of things taking off mm -hmm. um well i think it's, it's really an unusual era of history in the world and i might be wrong about this but i think that it is unusual era when people are the face of their business right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. if we're going to be authentic and we want to be authentic people and we want to you know we sell dahlia tubers we are a for-profit nursery business mm -hmm. we don't we're not a church and we don't sell faith-based products at mm -hmm. all you know we could just be a little bit two-dimensional and just show just the flower part of our lives mm -hmm. but because i think especially on social media people are really interested in knowing more of your whole story mm -hmm. i mean let's be honest we're not showing the messy back pasture right we're <laughs> we're, we're trying to keep oh, that instagram aesthetic <laughs> that's a separate tour that's the yeah. that's the halloween tour right yeah, you know right, exactly. this the messy back pasture right that's what i call yeah the laundry basket mm -hmm. yes exactly yeah. right so we're not i mean we're not trying to be that authentic but yeah. we are trying to present ourselves as whole people yeah. like the fact that we're married and we're business partners is really interesting mm -hmm. to people and because faith is a big part of our lives, it has entered into, our, especially our social media presence. Triple Ren has had for the past three or four years an evening that's like a Christian women's mm -hmm. evening, or this year it's going to be a Christian family evening. And we have wrestled with this, honestly. Like, it's not the main thrust of our business. It's just we do this out of the extra because it's what it's we part love. Of who you are. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so it yeah. has ended up that way. And I try to not be afraid to talk about my faith. I'm not doing a weekly sermon and Steve's not yeah. doing a weekly <laughs> sermon on our Instagram, but we, but if it's something that matches and we, we Unless let there's it, a demand for that. Yeah. We <laughs> let have it. Hey, this guy over here, I know the lane. I know that's the lane. a different, that's yeah. a different Instagram. Yeah. It's a different starting. side. Yeah. 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 But it does come out sometimes just naturally in the way that we are. And sometimes I feel a little afraid because it does alienate some of our customers who um, don't have the same faith. It has. We've, had, we've experienced yeah. that. We've experienced people being upset with us for talking about our faith, but I don't look at it as, anything particularly difficult. I just, we don't talk about politics on our mm. platform. It's, it's a good just thing not something, to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. it's just something we absolutely Speaking of which, do. let's talk about politics <laughs> yeah. right now. Yeah. Let's dive into it. There's lots of things that we're just like, no, our business doesn't need to take a stand on this. We, right. we are yeah. real people and we have political views, but we don't, but this is something that is such yeah. an integral part of our, 
our right. lives that it has bled into it a little bit. Right, because yeah. it dictates yeah. what we're doing. Well, but the beautiful part is that you're not taking a stance. You're just being you. And that's powerful. And you're selling dahlias. And it just happens to be a part of, as people follow along with who you are, your brand, what it represents, they are uh, very clear, like, this is who they are. I love their product. In fact, they, they could disagree with who you are and what you do. I would find that very hard to disagree with who you guys are. But like for the person that just wants dollies, they can also still shop right? and buy dollies at Tubers. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And, and it's something that is evolving for us too. Like we're just trying to learn how to navigate this. Is, we did not have a clear trajectory for how we would blend our business and our faith. You know, there's mm -hmm. no plan for that exactly. Mm -hmm. We just really, we realized that we have resources at our farm that would lend itself to, we do a biannual dye camp. Mm -hmm. People can come and just get three really intensive days of learning dyes in our field because mm -hmm. it's perfectly set up for it. We have illustrations of what to do and what not to do. We have, <laughs> we have a classroom situation and it's all perfect. But there's other events that fit really nicely in it too. We do a yearly dye festival mm -hmm. um, where usually we have between 1,500 and 2,000 people come through the farm over a weekend and they pay $10 to get in and then they can, if they want to pay to you pick flowers, they can, but they just really want to, it's kind of like the Tulip Festival, only a much smaller mm -hmm. scale. And way prettier. Yeah, less yeah. traffic. Yeah, yeah, less traffic and instead of having a field of yellow, we have 15 different types of yellow. Yeah. I know where I'm going next year. You, you need to come. And we've actually shifted it in 2023 where it's going to be three evenings. So it's all at golden hour. It's going to be well, maybe we, we should set the tone that there is tons of traffic. So no one, <laughs> only the right people show up to it. Well, we do and we don't have to deal with Seattle. Our, okay. our, yeah. our neighbors, uh, our neighbors on Zell Road, thank you in advance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're so patient with us. They know it's yeah. just a short time. But we sell tickets and we usually do sell out because we mm. do have limited parking. So we can't just keep it open for everybody. Our neighbor is so kind and lets us park on the edge of his field, sometimes in his field, depending on where he is on cutting hay. Mm -hmm. He's so kind. We have just been surrounded by, and that's the thing that I think we really have a lot to be grateful for, that as we have grown in this business, we've had colleagues and friends, new friends here in Whatcom County and neighbors who have just leaned into our lives in such a gracious and kind way. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't even own the property we have now if it wasn't for a farmer neighbor who um, was near us when we were babysitting at the orchard who told us about an yeah. opportunity and we were able to buy the farm we have now. So. Yeah. So let's talk about the events really quickly. So it sounds like you're monetized. They're monetized. So you pay people pay to show up. It's production. There's there's things happening that yeah. you pick. But it's not the most profitable part of your business, I'm assuming, because dahlias seem to be pretty yeah. pretty profitable. Yeah. But you do it for community relationships, getting people in person with your brand, even with the ability to to market to seventy five thousand plus people. How powerful, you know, on the scale of profitability and awareness, brand awareness. Tell me about why you started doing these events, like why it was important. You, like it's not, you, you could maybe scooch the rows over and do more dahlias and that would make you more money, but you found this need to yeah. connect with your customer. Yeah, it's again, back to who we are, yeah. right? And we started doing it with the Sustainable Connections Farm Tour. That's the first year we did it. We called mm -hmm. it a dahlia oh, yeah, festival yeah, yeah. associated with their tour That's because right. we wanted to be a part, you were a part of their farm Yeah, they partner. had a business program that mm -hmm. I, uh, that I went through. And, it was really valuable um, to us. Yeah, it yeah. kind of helped straighten out some things and it, it, it solidified some things that we were kind of curious about, but they introduced us to other farmers. And then those farmers were like, you know, you're going to want to make sure that you have this and you're going to want to. Mm. And so, so kind. Yeah, yeah, so in the, in the very beginning, you like, you don't know which direction is up. So that helped there. And then they want to create an awareness for the farms. Mm -hmm. And so we were part of that. We ended up moving, it, we outgrew that a little bit. We mm -hmm. ended up having a festival that was plenty more than enough to bring people to only our farm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, yeah, yeah that, it's a really good question. People fly to our tour. We sell a VIP a couple hours before for a VIP. People fly from almost every state. You know, brilliant. I love it. Yeah, this is great. And it's really crazy. They, they would like to talk to us and they would like to see. And I, it's actually really humbling to, mm. to think that people want to come. Because they think we're... Us. They think we're something special. <laughs> but I think it's you guys good. are pretty cool. It's good for not, being but you to also are very down to earth. Which yeah, is because like, there's yeah. nothing special about us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a good event to bring tourism to Whatcom County. So there's that little aspect of it in my mind. I don't know how much we really impact by bringing, you know, 1,500 people here on a weekend. But in my mind, there's that. It is a really special thing to be able to see because we are people oriented and a lot of the business that we do now is an online store and we ship stuff away. We never really get to see. We shipped almost 46,000 diet tubers last year. So those went into gardens and hopefully they mostly grew. People's mostly. Gardens. Well, and, and at, at some have, point it's on the user, right? Yeah. 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 It's a user problem. Yeah, we have user error. Green babies, yeah. all, green baby yeah. flowers all over yeah. the country. We only ship in the United States, but 
it's really special when we get to have people come and they they are able to and it's really fun to watch them enjoy what we've created mm -hmm. at the farm we tried really hard to make it a beautiful place our slogan is that we share beauty actually not just that we share beauty we changed that we want it to be share beauty so that you leo can share beauty too. Right. So, i love yeah. it meeting all those people and listening to their stories and a lot of them uh kind of shared personal like i was going through a really hard time and person in their family was sick and they really so uh, really kind of went through that hard time enjoying the beauty of the garden and we we're part of that mm -hmm. so it yeah, actually it things. fits really well with our farm because our crew also gets to see people enjoying the flowers which is really special for them mm -hmm. they work really hard for us and they work we work hard right with them but it, we get to see the emails and and the back end of the social media where they don't always get to see that so they get to see people and then it just means good hygiene for our farm if we're keeping it weed free and just cherry so it's ready for the festival. Mm -hmm. And you know, keep it a lot cleaner if you got visitors. You know, yeah, you clean your house before people come yeah over. right. <laughs> it's so true. And then also, just like we want to make sure that we see and observe and get feedback from people about what they enjoyed seeing most, which varieties they Not behind the keyboard. Most. That's nope. important too. Yeah. In person, people are a lot nicer. Yeah. For the most and part. for marketing. A lot less bold. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're talking to yeah. my face. Yeah. They don't really, yeah. And, and they're looking at the shirt and they're like, man, he's wearing a flower shirt. He's <laughs> he's bold. I can't be as bold as him right now. Well, also oh, it's a great too, shirt. it's just really great marketing because it's it's sort of like window shopping. Mm -hmm. And they are like, oh, beautiful that is i've got to have that and then they tell two friends about it who tell two friends about it and then mm -hmm. then we sell out sales really quick so <laughs> tell two they tell yeah. four that's yeah. right yeah. let's see if you can sell 16 of your friends yeah yeah <laughs> let's talk about the future you've talked a lot about adaptability and having this admiration for businesses at first you go they don't they don't know which direct their compass is spinning all direct mm -hmm. directions but then starting to realize that companies that know how to adapt and grow do have a direction and that's that direction is morphing with the the world and the way the world's changing. What's the next morph evolution growth for your business? What what are you wanting to to scale back on and, and scale up on? What what's what's your vision for these next year, five years? Creators. That's kind of the evolution that we're it's kind of the change. So instead of growing ten thousand mm -hmm. of this red dahlia that you can get all over the United States because everybody grows it, we're growing this dahlia here mm -hmm. where there's one farm in the United States who grows it because I just got it from the originator last year mm -hmm. and now i'm growing it you can't get it anywhere right you can't else and we make a yeah. really sweet deal for our hybridizers if we are the ones who exclusively release their dahlias into mm -hmm. the world then we give them a very high percentage of the sales for the first three years so that they they have a motivation to let us be the ones to be that first the exclusive distributor yeah. the first year yeah. yeah so it's it's really as we bring on more and more, and Steve is such a good relationship person. He's built these relationships at the Dio Society and then had a chance to go to people's homes and bring me along and get to meet them. But you're just such a friendly, lovely person that I think that it's you're well set to, um, to you are. Steve's <laughs> well shaking his head for those that are listening along right now. He, <laughs> he's denying it. He's, he's grimacing right now. <laughs> so 2012 to now, it's been a journey. Like yeah. all of this has been a journey for you guys. There's a lot of people out there that, maybe didn't have the same lack of ceiling on how they thought creativity, but they have a really good idea or they have a passion for something or, or, or why to do something. Um, and for those that are listening, a lot of them either are excited about hearing about local business owners and, and what they do and their story. Others are listening to get some motivation to start their own business. So in a nutshell, what's, what's some advice that you would give someone in either one of those, those stages of life? Just start. Just start. Do something. Yeah. Like Sarah was saying earlier, if you want to make whatever, do it. Find out what's involved in it. And and if you fail, that's not really failure. That's just, I mean, if it does, if whatever you do it doesn't succeed, that's a learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it's a cheap way to learn if you say, hey, I want to make jelly beans. Mm -hmm. And then you can't. Okay, well, now you know what not to do. Now figure out what to do. Get the popcorn, butter popcorn flavor out of there. <laughs> there you yeah. go. Oh, no, that's my favorite. Yeah. Oh, no, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, first person I've ever met who likes oh, the buttered popcorn. I, do. <laughs> but the, I, think I, I eat would... the black licorice. She eats the butter popcorn. <laughs> All right. I think I would expand it a little bit more to say set some goals. Mm. Like just be. That's true. Get started for sure, but like make a goal and try to meet that goal. Mm -hmm. And I would really encourage you. Um, I'm not just trying to sell her. I'm just starting to teach on Thursday, a two week everyday live course on goal setting for your garden. Right. Mm -hmm. But these, so in our new community, but I'm not just trying to sell that. Like, this is really what I passionately believe that if you set goals, 
and include in that set of goals that you set, um, some that stretch you a little bit mm -hmm. and push you a little bit further than you think you could go, you'll be very surprised at what you can actually accomplish. Like what, this past year, we did have this Christian Women's Night and we brought someone from Colorado, a well-known well person in Christian women's circles. And we had almost, we had more than 500 women at our farm that night. It was a huge stretch. Like mm -hmm. I had to rent this super expensive tent <laughs> to put them all in. Tents like, are <laughs> expensive it is, for the record. And, and, and it was my first time and I'm trying to act like I know what I'm doing, but it was scary. And it mm -hmm. was it was a big stretch for us to bring all those people and know where we're going to park all of them and like make sure y'all had a cute lemonade and a cute bag and all the things, you know, <laughs> but it was so rewarding. It yeah. was so great. And we would never have done it if we hadn't tried to do it. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. don't think we should just like shoot for the moon. I'm probably never going to get cool. in a rocket ship to the moon, but do seriously include some goals and then record meeting those goals and encourage yourself and then make bigger and bigger goals as you go. Yeah, just set attainable goals. Mm -hmm. Like you might not think that you can attain them, but make sure they're attainable and make sure they're measurable and then keep good records. Those are yeah. some keys, I Th think. Those are and repeat. Awesome. And repeat. Repeat and it. stretch. Repeat yeah. and stretch. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, I appreciate you both coming in here and, and sharing your story. The vulnerability around being a business owner. We have to put on this this sometimes this is just the, the shield that yeah. you know the, the rhino skin and you go out there and you just you just do it. Um, and sometimes there's you know you have a partner to talk to about it and sometimes you have no one to talk to about it. Yeah. So really appreciate you sharing your story and such an amazing business that you're running. You should be very proud of what you've created for a community, for the creators, but also like I just absolutely love and this gets me excited about why we do this, which is you just tried. You didn't really know what you're doing at the start, but you're willing to try. It's really inspiring. So I appreciate you coming in and, and telling your story because this is like my monthly, I know Tiffany and Coop, we get amped up monthly. We get to meet with people that are really rad and have just tried and, and gone out there and been relentless about their goals. So this is episode five. We did it. I appreciate you coming into the studio. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Building Bellingham is a community podcast exploring leadership, challenges, failure, and mindset with entrepreneurs right here in Whatcom County, Washington. You can be the first to hear about upcoming guests by subscribing to the Building Bellingham Facebook or Instagram pages, as well as the Building Bellingham YouTube channel. This episode was produced and edited by Tiffany Holden. Our videography is done by Cooper Hansley. Community projects are by Taylor Beal. To learn more about the team behind the podcast and to download our media kit, check out our website at www.livebellinghamnow.com or search Cohen Group NW on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or LinkedIn. From the whole Building Bellingham podcast team, thank you for listening.